chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, the first book in which Jesus wrote in the red, Matthew chapter 2. We're on the eve of another Christmas. It's amazing. We're working to try to get back. We are in our home. We're sleeping in it. It's not complete. There's a lot of little work we got to do trying to get that done and uh, just kind of looking forward to having some type of rhythm back in our lives again. I like what David said, and he, he was correct. I mean, uh, when I, I, I took that buck down, and it was, it was cold. We were out on the other side of Junction, a little town called Menard. I look at it, and he just, just shivering. And I'm fixing to take my coat off or my gloves. And he said, no, Pastor, I'm just excited. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I, I love that. And, and this morning, I, when I talked to my pastor on the way here, he said, how you doing? I said, well, I'm living by faith because I don't feel it this morning. I, don't, I said, I just finished praying, Pastor, that I'm going to sing myself into, into getting back, to having my spirit right. I'm going to praise myself into a place where I know that you are real in my life. Because I just, how many of you know what I'm talking about when I say I just don't feel it? I just don't feel it. And, and for me not to feel on Sunday morning is a terrible thing. So when I got in here, all I wanted to do was until I felt it, I was going to sing. Until I felt it, I was going to praise. And I, what I'm doing is, I'm telling you, I'm taking my own medicine. This is what I've preached for years. And I actually said that to myself. Okay, now, what is it that you've preached that will help you out right now? And I started thinking about praising and singing and realizing that the, the, the whole issue to me of this, the birth of Christ, uh, is an amazing thing. That he would come to earth. He condescended, Right? Amen. He, he did what nobody else would do. He came down from heaven. He left his throne in heaven and came here as a little baby. Amazing. Matthew chapter 2. I've given you time to find it. We'll start in verse 1. Are you comfortable? Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is the king? Is that... Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. And thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of you shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently that time, uh, what time the star appeared. And he sent to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when he had found him, bring him. When you find him, bring him to me. Give me word again that I may come and worship him. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over the place where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down. I want to pay attention here to the word young child. Everybody saw that? Everybody know where I'm going with that thought, right? I mean, it wasn't a baby Jesus. It was the toddler Jesus. That's why when you see the wise men in a nativity scene, mm -hmm, <laughs> knock them over. They don't belong there. And he fell down, and he worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Skip down to verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth or mad, upset, and sent forth and slew the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation, weeping, great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. Father, I thank you for divine appointments. I thank you for divine connections. 
I thank you for angelic meetings in our dreams and in our life. I thank you for a voice that speaks warnings to us and tells us to move this way or that. I thank you, Lord, for the life of the Christ child that changed our lives forever. As a matter of fact, has changed the whole world. God, I thank you as we stand here today. We give you praise for the coming of Christ that gave us salvation, that changed our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you give God a shout before you're seated? Amen. This is the story of the old fool and a bunch of wise men. What you got here is wise men and an old fool. An old fool, matter of fact, he tried to take out Christmas, literally. It's strange. It's bizarre. It doesn't seem like it should be in the Word of God. It doesn't seem like we should read it during this Christmas season. I know as I'm reading in the beginning, I can kind of feel y'all going, yeah, yeah, this is so warm and cuddly. And then all of a sudden, we shift to this wicked man named Herod. It, it, there's something about this. You think it's, the, you know, we, Pastor, we should be talk, talking about the, it's the season to be jolly, joy to the world. Hark the herald angels sing. Santa Claus is coming to town. I'll be home for Christmas. A little jingle bell rock, but all of a sudden we got this old fool we got to deal with. And if you miss out on Herod in this story of the Christmas story, you miss out on the redemption and the power of God. Over 2,000 years ago, the Christ child was born. One man wasn't happy at all. He's angry about the whole thing. He's like Ebenezer Scrooge. He's like the green thing, the Grinch that stole Christmas. He would prefer the whole thing just went away. Only he's not make-believe character. This is the real deal. He hates Christmas. He hates the Christ. He hates anyone that would try to usurp any kind of authority over him. His name was Herod. Herod, in the year 47 B.C., He's 25 years old. He's just been named the governor of Galilee. It's a high position for such a young man. The Romans hope Herod can pacify the Jews. He does after a fashion. When you study his life, he, he, he had a Ezekiel uh, executed. Later, he married into a leading Jewish family of the, uh, of the Hasmans. His wife named Merriman. In 40 B.C., the Roman Senate named him king of the Jews. It was a title that the Jews hated because he wasn't a Jew. He was Roman, but they called him the king of the Jews. As years rolled on, he proved to be a clever and a very cruel man. Like all kings, he was a tyrant. He was brutal, and he began to remove people out of his life for fear they would try to take over. His brother-in-law, he had him killed. His mother-in-law, he had her killed. His wife, he took her life. And in so doing, it started driving him mad. It was the murder of his wife that drove him into a place of... Um, of darkness, if you would. He killed her because he thought she was a threat to his power, but he never got over her. And even though he was only 44 when he took her out, and even when he lived to be 70, the murder that he did began to end his life. He was known as a great killer. It was in his nature. Everything about Herod. He killed out of spite. He killed to stay in power. Human life meant nothing to him. The great historian Josephus called him barbaric. Another writer dubbed him the malevolent maniac. Yet another named him the great pervert. Perhaps his basic character can best be seen in the incident in 7 B.C. Herod, as an old man, has been seen, has had power for 41 years. He knows he doesn't have much longer to live. Word comes that his sons are plotting to overthrow him. What did he do? He had his sons put to death. This is a wicked man. This is an old fool. Caesar Augustus said, It's safer to be Herod's sow than to be his son. His wife, his mother-in-law, his brother-in-law, his two sons, among hundreds of others, killing was what he did. The scripture says now two or three years later, Herod the great king of the Jews, he's slowly dying. Josephus describes his disease as a foul distemper. Amen. He's racked with convulsions. His breath is foul. His skin is covered with loathsome sores. He's rapidly losing his mind, but he's still the king. One day word comes to him from Jerusalem that some visitors have came. When the Magi came in, understand this. This wasn't three men. This was a, a, uh, a what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, say it again. 
entourage of men that came into the city with camels and donkeys, and they moved through there. It was like a parade when they showed up. Word hit Herod's palace that somebody had came to seek a little Christ child, something that he had prophetically heard about. And so he called these guys into him. When they came there, the Magi, the wise men, these guys and these, the Scripture don't even call them as what we would call Christian, amen, or believers, just men who studied history. Some believe they came from the lineage of Daniel, uh, not, not, Dan, not that Daniel had children, but that Daniel had influence in studying astrology. So they studied the stars. I like looking at the stars. Now, I know where uh, two dippers are. I get confused when somebody said, that's a horse and that's a cat. That bothers me. Because if you can come up with a horse and a cat out of them four stars, you've got an imagination. But there, there's this, this they look, and they knew the star was coming. They knew that, that the Christ child was going to be born. Amen. They had journeyed across the desert seeking an interview with Herod. Perhaps there were three. Perhaps there were more. I believe there were more. The important thing to Herod was not who they were, but who they asked for. Matthew 2, 2 says, where is the one who has been born, what, king of the Jews? Now, Herod was already king of the Jews. And to hear wise men coming from a foreign land saying, we want to find the king of the Jews, and we've come to worship him. You know, there are mysteries about this. Who, who were these wise men? Uh, where where they come from? All we know is from the east. They followed the star. They were looking for someone born king of the Jews. How could this be? Herod was the king of the Jews, but he was not born that way. He had to fight and kill and maim and hurt to gain his title. What were these men talking about? Verse 3 says, and Herod heard this. He was disturbed. He was troubled. The word disturbed means to shake violently. Amen. Not in happiness, not in excitement, but in, in, in upset. And, and no wonder. Finally, he had subdued all his enemies. He had killed all his foes. He took out most of his family. He was, of course, ready to die triumphant as king. And now he gets word that there is another king. When he had called together all the people, the chief priests and the teachers, he had to ask them, who was this Christ that's going to be born in Bethlehem and Judea? For this is what the prophet had written, verse 4 and 6. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will become a ruler who will be the shepherd of all the people. Suddenly things are getting serious. He's starting to plot a plan. He's got an idea. Maybe these strangers are onto something. What if the baby they're looking for is the Messiah? What if he's God? What if, what if, Herod may be many things, but fool, yes. Stupid, no. Have you ever met an unstupid fool? I have. Amen. So he begins to plot this plan to take him out. All tyrants are cowards at heart. They rule by force, and the one thing they fear most is a force that is greater than theirs. So now we got some wise men and an old fool. He plots this plan Amen, to take him out. And he says to them, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. Now, anybody that's got any history knows this guy is not going to go worship another one called king. They know he's going to try to take them out. So, so these wise men, they were up to the trick. They understood what was going on. Amen. They, 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 you know, here's an opportunity for them to send a troop to Bethlehem to check it out. He could have, but he could, would have attracted too much attention. Finally, you have to ask if Herod was so concerned, why didn't he go to Bethlehem to see him for himself? It's a good question. Why didn't Herod go? Because he didn't want to come face to face with the king sent from heaven. That would be too much. He would be forced to make a decision. Amen. The star miraculously reappeared and led them to the exact house. I'm just building up to my sermon. You'll hold on. When they found the baby Jesus, they, they bowed down. They worshiped him. They offered him his gifts. The Magi knew something Herod never knew. The little baby in a tiny house wrapped in rags would someday rule the world. They were not ashamed to give him the gifts. They were excited about it. They've been waiting for this moment. There are three lessons here, several, several lessons, as a matter of fact, to learn from the wise. First, what do you seek? During this holiday time, or even out throughout the year, what do you seek? Your level of joy at Christmas is directly related to what you are seeking. you got to ask the question, what is it I want out of Christmas? What is it that would make your Christmas wonderful and satisfying? You know, for me, when I was younger, when my kids were younger, it's doing something for them. Now they're older, I actually ask my pastor this question. What do you get older kids who's already gotten stuff all year long? More of that? Yeah, I guess so. He said cologne. I said, I like that. 
Memories. That's really what it's all about. It's just making memories, just working for it, looking for a feeling you define as a holiday spirit, finding the right present to give, giving the present you have been hoping or getting it. The problem with all these, they, they can leave us disappointed. It doesn't really matter a lot of us what we give to others. There's a disappointment that comes with it. You know what I have found, and I'm not asking this from anyone, but I have received texts from friends and family that mean more to me. They, there's things that I can save, I can hold on to, I can look back on. When, when they're not heads, I can show them. Do you remember this? Do you remember saying this to your dad? Do you remember how wonderful I was in December? How is it by February I'm this bad guy now? How many know what I'm talking about? Evidence. Somebody said, you, 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 you say, say it in money, say it in mink, but never, never say it in ink. Okay, I'll just leave it just right there. It's, it's in our expectation. Sometimes we're just looking for the wrong thing. The Magi show us how to increase our level of joy at Christmas by looking for the right thing. What was it they're looking for? Verse 2 tells us, They came to Jerusalem, but where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. They were looking for Jesus. Christmas for them was an opportunity to worship him. That is what we need to be looking for and expecting. I'm going to be honest with you. I know there's more of Jesus that I can get out of my life. I'm 58 years old, but there's more of him than I can get. I found him to be altogether wonderful. I found him to be my healer, my restorer, my strength. Amen. I love to worship him I'm reminded what Jesus said himself thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve there's something about with all your heart soul and spirit there's more of me that I can give him this year Amen. I've been, I'll be honest. I've been holding back just a little bit. I've been allowing my emotions over the flood and my emotions over friends that, that I've lost over the last few years that have gone for me. There's a little more of, him, of me I can give him. Amen. So I want to look in the right place. Well, well, where do you look? Your level of joy at Christmas is directly related to where you look. So where you look at the match I went, uh, where the, the king sh should be born, to the palace. They went to, to Herod's palace. They would say, well, we've got to go find the king. Surely he's in Jerusalem. Surely he's at the palace. So let's go to the palace. When they got there, they realized he's not here. Then the star reappears, and they followed the star out of town. And with it came the idea of when you find him, let Herod know. They weren't going to do that. We imagine that being with family is going to be joyful. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is a stressful headache. You know, things, especially, I'll say it particularly for Mama who's cooked and worked and, 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 and decorated and looked after things and, and made things right. And the kids come in and gobble it down and walk out and say, what's mine? This is not, that's not what I want. Hey, man, we, we used to have this thing uh, at, at Christmas where you give out gifts and all of a sudden you hear the paper ripping and, and the kids just bust into everything they got or, or they make fun of what they have because they think they already know what's in the box. And then they go through it and it's over. Man, we had to slow things down. I remember a couple years ago, we slowed things down. We open one at a time, go around the room, amen, let, let, let you give God a little praise for what you get. That's just the best way to do it. We, too, are tempted to look for joy at Christmas in the wrong places. We think by getting or giving the right gift, we'll be satisfied. We imagine that being with family is going to be good. All these things can disappoint us. The Magi looked at in the right place, and when they looked, they found God. Amen. The scribes in Jerusalem said that according to the prophet Micah, the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. Next thing that happens at Christmas time, what do you give? Your level of joy at Christmas is directly related to what you give. It's good to finally get to a place in your life when you feel like I can give just about anything to anyone at any time I want to. And if God directs me to bless somebody, I won't bless them. Amen. If he says I can give some, I can give that. I'm, I'm just going to do it. I, if, uh, this happened to me. Uh, it, you know, my, my kids don't have a lot. I understand that. But my son came to me the other day and he said, Dad, I built you, I made you something. I, he ain't got no money. He hadn't got a job right now. He's struggling with all this. But he said, I did something for you. And I know what he was doing because he kept asking me, Dad, is anybody going to use that lumber? My tools come up missing. So my tools are gone. My lumber's gone. And he takes me out in the woods and he said, Dad, look. I built you an archery stand right here. You walk off in the woods and stand right here. And I looked at it. And, and some would look at it and say, it's, you know, it's rickety, it's this, that, and the other. But I realized that is the greatest gift he could give me. And then I said to him, I said, son, I like this. This is nice, man. I can stand here and I can pull my bow. I shoot. But do you think any deer are going to walk across right there? 
And he went, I mean, we can figure it out. We can get something to get them to walk across there, you know. But, but yeah, we'll bait them in somehow. I said, normally you put a bow stand where you know they're good, but it, it, that's okay. You did good. Amen. And then I've been gathering my tools back ever since. But it was the heart of it. And I think that's what makes everything so good. Amen. Just having the heart of it. Well, what do you give? The match I came to Jesus' house bearing gifts. The gifts they gave were entirely appropriate. They gave gold, a gift for a king. By giving it, they acknowledged that Jesus was and is the king. They had these gifts when they saw Herod, but they weren't going to give them to Herod. Herod's been giving gift after gift. He's taking gifts. He, he, he's, he's maligned himself. He, he's been... Um, Everything about him has been all about him. And they kept these gifts. They didn't say anything to him what they were going to do with their gifts or what they were going to do when they saw him. They just said, we're going to worship him. When they got there, they gave him. They gave him the gold. They acknowledged he was king. They gave him frankincense, a gift for a priest. This was incense the priest used in the temple. By giving it, they acknowledged that Jesus was a priest, the one who would bring us to God. They gave him myrrh, a gift for the dead. It was a fragrant ointment used to anoint a body before burial. By giving it, they acknowledged that Jesus had come to die for the sins of the world. You know, we might, uh, might ought to give appropriate gifts as well. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about material gifts. I'm talking about more important things. And some have already said it. The gifts of memory. We ought to give the gifts of our love and our kindness. Amen. The gift uh, of our, our help. Sometimes I can't give you a lot, but I can give you some help. I can come over, and, and I'm pretty good at networking. If I, if I can't do the work, maybe I can find somebody to do it for you. Amen. To, to do that way, we ought to give the gift of forgiveness to those who have hurt us. Giving these gifts will result in a joyous and a wonderful Christmas. But you saw what Christmas was like at this day. The day that Jesus was born, and those few years he was alive on earth as he began to grow and in stature and all that, the scripture says, first there was hostility. Herod represents the world's welcoming committee to the Son of God. This world hates your Jesus. This world does not celebrate the Christmas you're celebrating. They're celebrating an opportunity to give gifts and to get gifts. But they missed the whole reason. As a young boy coming up, I knew what Christmas was. I was told by my parents it was the birth of Jesus. But I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know him. I, we just gave gifts and got gifts. It, it was almost a meaningless a tradition that we did. But when I got born again, boom, my eyes opened. I mean, it was like everything changed inside of me. And I didn't become anti-Christmas. Some people can become anti-Christmas after that. But I was all into it, man. I understood the tree that Jesus died on. I understood the gifts under the tree that the wise men gave gifts. That's why we give gifts. Amen. All of these things started coming back to me. The, the, the meaning of it, the understanding. But this is a hostile world. John 1, 11 says he came to what? To what was his own, but his own did not receive him. There's nothing like finding somebody on your DNA tree and realizing you're kin to them. Walk up to them and say, hi, my name is this, and you're my uncle, or you're my aunt, or God forbid, my dad. Amen. And you say it, and next thing you know, they reject you. Jesus came to this world, and they rejected him. They put him down. He condescended here, and they rejected him. Herod stands for that bloodthirsty, cruel, vindictive side of the world system, a world where life is cheap. A world where killing is accepted and expected. Herod died. But this spirit of Herod, it lives on. To this day, there are those who are offended by Jesus. Even by the mere mention of his name, they oppose spiritual truth. And they want to erase every trace of Christmas from public life. This group includes those cowardly school administrators who won't even use the word Christmas. They banished it and used holidays. and ho What is it? Holiday time. Whatever. They just kicked Christmas out, amen, from the classroom. The lawyers who sued to have crosses and manger scenes removed from city halls across America, Herod would be proud of them. Second, the indifference. You remember me reading about the scribes? There were scribes there. There were men of understanding that were there. The scribes represented the religious indifference that these are the insiders, the overeducated theologians who knew all the facts and do nothing about it. I hate when I hear this term, Christian University, full of agnostic and atheist teachers. That's not a Christian university. That, that, that college has nothing to do with Christ. Right. Amen. If anything, they're abandoned him Amen. And, and have abandoned the Bible. They, they, they're over 
educated. Or they're know-it-alls. They don't care enough to get excited. When Herod asked where the baby was to be born, they knew the answer. They told him where to look, but they didn't care enough to investigate it themselves. Bethlehem is only six miles from Jerusalem, but even that was too far to go. It was academic to them. Hope you have a nice trip. If you find the Messiah, let us know. They would have been singing and dancing because the Messiah had come. Instead, they ignored his birth. Who looks worse, Herod or the scribes? The scribes looked like those uh, looked worse to me because Herod, for all his excuses and foolishness, is at least acting consistently based on his nature. But these men, they knew the truth and did nothing about it. And then we live in a world that knows the truth, have heard the truth, and done nothing about it. We, we've taught our kids and our kids' kids, people of the churches all around the world have heard about the gospel and they're indifferent. It's not exciting to them. It's just kind of a, a, a moving through. I want more Jesus this year. I, I want to forgive deeply. I had a situation happen to me a couple of weeks ago. Some of you would be familiar with. Most of you wouldn't. Of a friend of mine that died three years ago. And when the message came to me, why weren't you there when he died? And he was as close to me as a brother. And I thought, and I beat myself up. And I, I walked through it. I questioned it. I thought maybe it was shame. Maybe it was uh, I couldn't do anything about it. Uh, he doesn't go to, he doesn't, he's not in my church, but he was one of my close friends. And I fought over this thing. And I fought over it. All night long, I wrestled. I couldn't sleep. And I got up and I looked at the text and I backed it up. And the last text I had made was 2016 to this person. I looked at it again and I said, God, help me. I'm not that man. I'm not a man that would let a brother go without spending time. I did see him before they passed, but it was a little late. Why didn't I get to see him? And then it hit me. In September of that same year, my sister died. And then October of the same year, the next month, my daddy died. And then two weeks later, my friend died. And I hadn't had a chance in those months during the worst time of his sickness to get to him. And I beat myself up. And I, I wrestled with it. And then I called that person and I said, you got to forgive me. But this is what happened. And all of a sudden, you ever had that paradigm shift? And all of a sudden, instead of them being mad at me, they were mad at themselves. I, I, I apologize, Pastor. I didn't know your sister had died. I hadn't talked to you in three years. I didn't know your daddy had died. I didn't know all those things had happened just like that. And I realized as I move closer to this time of the year, what I want in my life is to make sure I, I clear those things in people's lives. I don't want them living another day with thinking that mad at me or upset with me because of something I did. I want to make sure I got, I got my, my balance sheet is good. Can I get an amen? Amen. These men knew the truth. They did nothing about it. Sometimes you know something and you don't do anything about it. For me, I had to do something about it. I had to make some change. I had to make sure, okay, I know me. I want to make sure this is done right. And ever since then, you're talking about a sweetness and a kindness between two people. Amen. It's all right now. It's all right now. Do something about it. The, the last point I make with this is worship. Amen. Some are hostile during Christmas. Some are indifferent during Christmas. But what I heard this morning was worship. What I heard this morning was a people that didn't mind getting up and getting to church early and worshiping. Some people that have had already some Christmas miracles in their own life when things were going wrong. Now they're here today. They were sick a couple of weeks ago, and now they're good. Worship. Everybody say worship. Amen. I want to worship him before I get sick. I want to worship him while I'm sick. I want to worship him after I'm sick. I just got to keep worth. He's worthy to be worshiped. Can I get amen? They, they are the wise men who when they found. I'm telling you, there's an old fool. Fool, no fools, fools ain't gonna worship. But a wise man, those that are wise have wisdom. Those that are wise know their God, Amen. And they worship Him. They begin to give it, uh, give it up to Him. They were those who, when they found Him, they bowed down. They gave Him what He was worth. It is an ironic twist of this story that it is these pagans, and I say that in kindness of these wise men, because we don't know their background, but they recognize Jesus for who He really is. I found sometimes church folk, they miss it. But people that are on the outside looking in, they begin to catch it. Herod knows and he tries to kill him. The scribes know and they ignore him. But the wise men prove themselves worthy of their name. When they found him, they worshiped him gladly. These responses are going to happen this year. You're going to some people hostile. All they're going to be doing is about shopping, getting what they want. Some are going to be indifferent. It's just not a holiday. But to me... It's a special time of the year. Amen. It's a special time. How, how do you respond? How do you say it? It's not what you know. 
But it's what you do with what you know that saves us. Christmas. Stand with me if you would. If you're able. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, give me hope for tomorrow. When I have to live by faith, God, show me your unfailing hand. When my body gets weak, strengthen my feeble knees and the hands that hang down. Jesus, don't let my mind grow gray. Keep me remembering the good days when the bad days come. Jesus, this Christmas, I just want more relationship with you. I want to find you closer to me. I want your word to come alive when I read it. I want to see Peter walking on the water. I want to see the man lowered through the roof. I want to see the paralytic walk, blind eyes open. Jesus, this Christmas, let the Word of God come alive to me. Let me find myself among the prophets, hanging out in a cave with David, reminding myself that solitude brings great strength. Jesus, let this Christmas mean more to me this year than ever. Let the grandkids rejoice this Christmas. For grandparents and guardians that look over them, love them, and because of them, they'll have a future. God, I ask your blessing on this house. Lord, everybody, we've all grown up in here. We've grown, some grown up in this church, God. I thank you for your hand. God, let this be the sweetest of all. And more than anything, Jesus, let us give you the gift of gold. You are our king of frankincense and worship you. And remind ourselves that it was your death that changed our life after your resurrection. Heads bowed for a moment. Maybe you were like your preacher this morning. You came to church living by faith. Your feelings had kind of forsaken you. You, you don't even feel like you're saved. I mean, it's like, God help me. I, I don't know what's going on here. I don't feel this thing. If that's you, just lift your hand up now. Let me pray for you. Because I know your feelings. I know how you're feeling. Amen. It's several hands up. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray over these. I speak, God, into their. You made them men and women of emotion. And God, I tell you, will be emotion put back inside of them. They will feel the tears. They will feel the laughter. God, they will sense your presence over the next few weeks. They're going to, it's going to change, God. Those feelings of being alone and being isolated, to be in solitude, and nobody cares anymore. God is going to leave right now in the name of Jesus. I stand on your word that you will never leave us nor forsake us so that we may boldly say that you are our king. You are our Lord. I bless these people, God, in Jesus' name. And everyone shout. Amen. Come on, give God one more praise. Amen. You can be a wise person or an old fool. I just want faith to finish. I just want faith to finish. Amen. I just want to finish. Be seated for a brief moment of servant leaders to come up. I need your prayers to be praying for our New Caney campus that we get, you know, things still ain't right with so much electrical and air conditioning, heat, those things. We, we cafeteria, the freezer goes out and it's full of meat this week. I mean, we just, it's always seemed like something. So I want you to pray, amen, that God will give a, a sense of rest for the people there. Amen. We'll see a spirit of revival in both churches. Hallelujah. As we get close to the end of this year, your giving means more than ever. I know some have a, a year-end giving that you always do. But if you need to tie the offering envelope, amen, again, to honor God, lift your hand. Thank you for your faithfulness. You can make your checks out to TLCC or you can give online. There's a place to give online. And uh, there's also through our app if you're watching. Hallelujah. David.